Our guest today, our discussion leader today is Joe Reinhardt. And our topic is the Crusades based on that book that just disappeared. So, Joe, it's all yours. Thank you, Judy. Uh, I'm going to mute uh, everyone, but uh, this is, uh, I intend it to be anyway, a, an interactive session. I, I don't want to lecture for uh, 45 minutes or an hour. So if you have a comment or question, uh, feel free to unmute uh, and uh, raise your hand or just interject uh, whenever there is a pause. Uh, we'll try to limit uh, comments and questions to around two minutes uh, so that, uh, again, that doesn't become a sermon instead of a, of a discussion. And um, um, mainly uh, my plan is simply to uh, read from the text and then um, uh, discuss uh, uh, points uh, that I've highlighted. Uh, and hopefully, again, uh, we'll have some interaction uh, uh, from the group. So it's certainly welcome. Um, and uh, don't uh, hesitate to interrupt uh, at the, in an opportune moment if you have a comment uh, or a question. Uh, and if we get a lot of people wanting to speak, uh, then we'll, we'll start raising hands. and. Uh, Judy, uh, will you uh, control the um, uh, calling out who has their hand up first as much as possible? We'll try to do, do them in order. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the question that is, um, are, um, is there anyone that's uh, familiar with uh, the text uh, that has uh, read it uh, either in the past uh, or has read it uh, in the last few days in preparation for today? Uh, I think we'll be lucky if we get through the first three crusades uh, this afternoon. So. <clears throat> so, anyway, uh, I read a little bit. Hand. Okay, well, that's that's enough to get you started. Um, <laughs> ah, there it is, right there. Okay, it, it is a rather impressive tome. Uh, it's uh, as I said a little while ago, it's right at seven hundred pages. Uh, so, um, there are plenty of extraordinary popular delusions. It's nothing new. Uh, people have been playing the fool for a long time. <laughs> and there are some really good examples of uh, the um, um, Darwinism in action, uh, as they say, you know, every year the, the Darwinism sweepstakes where certain people die and get out of the gene pool to the benefit of all of us. <laughs> so, all right. Um, this was first published in uh, 1841, I believe. Um, by uh, Charles Mackay, uh, and uh, we're going to talk today about the Crusades, which um, he begins with a little quote uh, from uh, Paradise Lost, I'll forego the quote, and, but it begins um, with, um, every age has its peculiar folly, some scheme, project, or fantasy <clears throat> into which it plunges, spurred on either by the love of gain the necessity of excitement or the mere force of imitation. Failing in these, it has some madness to which it is goaded by political or religious causes or both combined. Every one of these causes influenced the Crusades and conspired to render them the most extraordinary instance upon record of the extent to which popular enthusiasm can be carried History in her solemn page informs us that the Crusaders were but ignorant and savage men, that their motives were those of bigotry, uh, unmitigated, and that the pathway was one of blood and tears. The romantic versions of the Crusades, on the other hand, dilates upon their piety and hero heroism and portrays in her most glowing and impassioned use their virtue and magnanimity. Magnanimity, <laughs> say that the imperishable honor they acquired for themselves and the great services they rendered to Christianity. Curiously, one of the great services they rendered was that they helped to bring on uh, the Renaissance um, because after uh, oh, almost four centuries and 12 crusades and hundreds and hundreds, millions of dead, uh, people began to ask themselves, well, why do the Muslims still own the Holy Land if our uh, omnipotent, uh, invincible God uh, can uh, uh, steer Joshua to the slaughter of millions of people 
uh, why can't we? And so people began to question uh, some of the uh, religious uh, ideologies uh, as a consequence of the Crusades. And so uh, also since the Saracens were, were more civilized and educated than the Christians of Europe at that time, it had a refining effect uh, upon the Europeans. It uh, brought uh, culture uh, uh, to the uh, uh, to the West. Um, among them, I think the, the game of chess, although I'm not sure, I, I don't recall reading that, but I seem to just uh, remember it uh, as being the case. So, um, the first uh, crusade uh, was preached by uh, Peter the Hermit. Um, one of the other crusades early on, and, and one of his competitors, sort of, or, or allies, if you will, was Walter the Penniless. Uh, what a great bunch of people. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's my claim to fame is that I don't have a dime. Walter the Penniless. I think I'm a brother in law uh, like that, but I, I won't get into that either. Um, in order to understand thoroughly the state of public feeling in Europe at the time when Peter the Hermit preached the Holy War, it will be necessary to go back for many years anterior to that event. We must make acquaintance with the pilgrims of the 8th, 9th, and 10th centuries and learn the tales they told of the dangers they had passed and the wonders they had seen. Now, as the year, um, um, as the 10th century was uh, coming along, of course, uh, being the end of the millennia, you'll recall that uh, when the 20th when the 20th century uh, passed away, uh, there was a great a clamor uh, in our time that the world would be coming to an end, that the apocalypse was finally on, it, the second coming uh, was imminent, and so on and so forth. Um, well, I think if you multiply that uh, by some factor, you'll reach the frenzy uh, that happened, that was happening uh, around the 10th century. And of course, the, the people at that time were more religious uh, and more superstitious. Um, they weren't any more rapacious, but uh, that had a lot to do with it as well. So, the pious and the impious alike flocked to Jerusalem. The one class to feast their sight on the scenes hallowed by the life and sufferings of their Lord. And the other, because it soon became a generally received opinion that such a pilgrimage was sufficient to rub off the long score of sins, however atrocious. Another and very numerous class of pilgrims were the Isle and Roby, who visited Palestine then as the moderns visit Italy or Switzerland now because it was the fashion and because they might please their vanity by retelling on their return the adventures they had met with. In other words, the Holy Land was a tourist trap or a tourist attraction, if you will, just like it is now. Uh, ever since uh, the uh, crucifixion, people have been going to the Holy Land uh, where you can see uh, Lot's wife um, uh, and a statue of salt uh, where you can, um, and visit the place of the cross and the, uh, the hill of the skull and on and on. But the point is, uh, it brings in a lot of money. Um, unfortunately, uh, as the millennia uh, approached, the, there was a tidal wave of pilgrims and um, most of those were poor. They weren't there because it was fashionable, fashionable or because they wanted to go there uh, on their own accord. They were there because of their religious fervor and because all of their sins could be washed away um, by going to the Holy Land and they would go directly to heaven uh, as soon as uh, Jesus reappeared uh, at the beginning of the uh, 11th century. Um, also, um, Again, since all of their sins uh, were atoned for by their pilgrimage, it meant that they could rape and plunder or whatever they wanted to do without any fear of any consequences. They could wake up the next morning uh, and the police weren't beating on their door, or the military. It was sort of like, oh, uh, Groundhog Day, <laughs> where, if, for those of you who have seen Groundhog Day, when it dawns on 
Phil Collins that he can do anything uh, uh, without consequence. He starts trying to kill himself and picking up women and stealing money and, and playing chicken with trains, you know, things like that. <laughs> so, so the uh, the mindset of the average pilgrim was pretty much the same that he could didn't need uh, uh, to have any wealth whatever. In fact, most, many of them sold everything they had in order to go to the Holy Land, and oftentimes at ruinous prices. But they understood that they could rape and plunder uh, their way, uh, and so. Um, and of course, God was on their side, so they couldn't do any wrong and they couldn't fail. So off they went. Um, <laughs> I like the part where he talks about um, to the pilgrims, every object was precious. Relics were eagerly sought after. Well, gee, don't don't they sell uh, uh, items or mementos at, uh, at every tourist trap? Uh, you can take home T-shirts and hats and you name it, right? Uh, souvenirs of your trip. Well, they did the same thing uh, in the Holy Land uh, back in the uh, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th centuries. So they still do it today, right? You could get wood of the true cross. You could get tears of the Virgin Mary. You could get the hems of her garments. Oh, this is a good one. You could get the toenails and the hair of the apostles. Even the tents that Paul had helped to manufacture were exhibited for sale by the navies navish in Palestine and brought back to Europe with wondrous cost and care. A grove of a hundred oaks would not have furnished all the wood sold in little morsels as remnants of the true cross, and the tears of Mary, if collected together, would have filled a cistern. <laughs> For upwards of 200 years, the pilgrims met with no impediment in, in Palestine. The enlightened, I won't try to pronounce his name, Harun al-Rashid and his more immediate successors were encouraged uh, the stream and because it brought so much wealth into Syria. But they, uh, caliphs uh, changed power and uh, the new house of Abbas uh, didn't much care for the uh, 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 pilgrims and they imposed the tax of a Byzant one pazuza uh, for uh, each pilgrim that entered, which was a very serious hardship since at this point, as the millennia approached, the flood of uh, uh, pilgrims, uh, most of them were had zero monies whatsoever, and huge crowds would collect uh, at the gate waiting for some nobleman to come along and pay the uh, bazant for each one uh, to be able to enter the, ho the holy land. And he says, and upon no occasion, was such a boon refused. <laughs> so, <clears throat> how are we going so far? Anybody have anything they care to say? <clears throat> there are a number Joe, of I just items. posted a couple of questions in a, on the chat. Yeah. Do you want to look at the chat or do you want me to read it to you, Joe? Go ahead and read it to me, Judy, please. Um, okay. Um, Jim Peterson says Muslim scholars copied and brought to the West virtually the entire canon of the ancient world, especially the Greek and Roman traditions, and there were no small measure of Muslim gold undoubtedly rubbed off on the more ab avaricious <coughs> traders. The Templars stand as a good example. <coughs> um, ambitious Muslims made a few coins with wood chips prices of the true cross, pieces of the true cross, sorry. Um, so was the first crusader a Muslim or from the current day Middle East? What was expressed as the reason for a crusade? Uh, the reason for the crusades uh, were twofold. Uh, one is the um, poor treatment uh, of pilgrims uh, by the current rulers of the Holy Land and the imposition of a tax. And the other was that the Muslims had absolutely no right whatsoever to be um, rulers uh, in the land uh, where uh, our Lord and Savior was born and preached the one and only true religion, Christianity. Um, and those two uh, factors uh, combined uh, to bring about the uh, crusade. Again, plus the fact that, that everyone thought that the world was coming to an end and Christ would be appearing any day now. Uh, and uh, 
one way to overcome all of their bad deeds was to make off for the Holy Land. So, so it was greed, it was fear, <laughs> and uh, it was uh, coupled with religious fervor, um, a very dangerous combination, as we shall see. So the, the, I'm sorry, I, I got lost a little bit in that. So the answer to the first, was the first crusader a Muslim is no, right? It's, they were Christian. That's right, no. The first crusader uh, uh, crusaders were all Europeans. The, the Muslims never uh, invaded. Uh, yeah, that's I, what I thought. That I, part of the crusades in any case. Um, and Dan says that he thinks it was Phil Connor in a Groundhog Day. I didn't hear you, Judy. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, Phil Connor was the, the character in Groundhog Day. Right. Didn't I say Phil Connors? I think you said Phil Carson, but I'm not sure. Collins. I think Collins, I said Phil. That's what you said. Yeah. Thank you for correcting me. Oh, oh, I bit my tongue. Ah. Um, Gary? I was, I was uh, going to ask, is, is that promulgation of we need to go and, and save the Holy Land, um, I'm, I'm, I don't know, and I'm asking if, if you or someone can shed light on it, was it really this, this joint effort between the religious political leadership, or was there a really a dichotomy there, and, and the religious leaders were able to marshal the activities and somehow get a political blessing to make it happen? Well, it was primarily uh, religious. The uh, political forces um, uh, stayed out of it, at, at least initially. Uh, the first um, crusade was preached by uh, Peter the Hermit, but it was Pope Urban. Uh, in fact, he, he went and uh, had an audience with uh, Pope Urban and sold him on the idea of a crusade. So it was Pope Urban who preached the first crusade, but it was Peter the Hermit who was the uh, uh, catalyst for it. Thank you. So, so you see, it's a combination of, uh, um, I guess, uh, entrepreneur, which is what Peter the Hermit really was, uh, and religious fervor. And then the state enters into it to the extent that uh, there's all kinds of uh, plunder to be involved. I mean, there are a lot of riches in the Holy Land, uh, as well as ransoms uh, and uh, uh, other types of uh, uh, forcing them to tithe uh, to the Christian church or whatever. So there were a lot of reasons to do it. And as I said a minute ago, some people were motivated by uh, ideals and other people were motivated by greed. Mostly the aristocracy um, would be the latter. But, but in my naivete, I, I believe, I, I want to believe somehow that the, the cultural fabric of society was such that the church was, was equally important or more important than, than political leadership. And so that, that's why they could marshal the forces and, 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 and present this as a, a righteous thing to do. Is that, is that fair? Oh, yeah. The, the church was more powerful than the, than the state at that time. And uh, it exercised it flexed its muscles in some ways, uh, as McKay points out here, by um, um, pressing or n nudging the uh, aristocracy or, or the uh, political elite uh, to participate. Jim Peterson? Oh, yes. Well, uh, yeah, I wanted to ask about um, the role of, um, even though it was subtle, but the, the, the political role of Western Europe at the time, uh, because it was in a rather poor state of affairs, mostly uh, disorganized and uh, not operating at the level that is suggested by emperors, kings, and so forth. There's many lords, lo uh, local Life lords, comes, better, mostly. Uh, yeah, and so forth. Uh, but about the um, the role of the of, of the Crusades, I think it had something to do also with the need for a, a material demonstration of the existence of the characters of the New Testament. So bringing back all those even fake uh, chips of wood and uh, bits of cloth and um, the bowls and beakers and so forth, whatever they were picking up here and there. Uh, was an important, um, it would seem to me, an important function uh, that the uh, that the church needed to establish its legitimacy. Let me read you what McKay has to say on the subject. Before entering into any further details of the marvelous results of his preaching, 
meaning Peter the Hermit, it will be advisable to cast a glance at the state of mind of Europe that we may understand all the better the causes of his success. First of all, there was the priesthood, which, exercising as it did the most conspicuous influence upon the fortunes of society, claims the largest share of attention. Religion was the ruling idea of that day, and the only civilizer capable of taming such wolves as then constituted the flock of the faithful. The clergy were, all in all, and though they kept the popular mind in the most slavish subjection with regard to religious matters, they furnished it with the means of defense against all other oppression except their own. In other words, God will protect you from everybody but me. <laughs> so, in the ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical ranks were concentrated all the true piety, all the learning, all the wisdom of the time, and as a natural consequence, a great portion of power, which their very wisdom perpetually incited them to extend. <laughs> so, uh, the people knew nothing of kings uh, and barons and nobles, except in the way of injuries inflicted. <laughs> they knew a lot about religion. So it, uh, it is religion is the motivating force. And, and again, to the extent that they hold a lot of sway uh, over the aristocracy, uh, they can, uh, again, bring uh, pressure to bear for them to participate. Plus, there is the carrot of the fact that there's all the rape and plunder you can stand. First they hold the sway, then they hold the swag. <laughs> but Joe, how much could the normal, regular population know about religion when most of them couldn't read, um, couldn't really know anything except what the priest told them, is that correct? Oh, absolutely. Um, 100%. <laughs> In most cases, of what they knew uh, is what they were told. He mentions here that with the millennia approaching that every time there's a, a meteorite or an earthquake or some weather phenomena, uh, people uh, are more and more convinced that the end of the world is imminent. They begin selling off their properties uh, for pennies on the dollar uh, and uh, heading off for the, for the Holy Land. Every class of society was, in light, was alike and decided to join or encourage the war kings and clergy by policy, the nobles by turbulence and the love of dominion, and the people by religious zeal and the concentrated enthusiasm of two centuries, skillfully directed by their own instructors. It was in Palestine itself that Peter the Hermit first conceived the grand idea of rousing the powers of Christendom to rescue, to rescue the Christians of the East from the thraldom of the Muslims and the sepulchre of Jesus, from the rude hands of the infidel, the subject engrossed his whole mind. Even in the visions of the night, he was full of it. <laughs> he was full of it. One dream made such an impression upon him that he devoutly believed the savior of the world himself appeared before him and promised him aid and protection in his holy undertaking. If his zeal had ever wavered before, this was sufficient to fix it forever. So, um, Peter had um, divine inspiration. Uh, he recognized, of course, that it was a great opportunity um, to gain both power and wealth and influence, which he did, <laughs> as a matter of fact. So, it says that he, um, had, after having performed all the penances and duties, he demanded an interview with Simeon, the patriarch of the Greek church at Jerusalem. Though the latter was a heretic in Peter's eyes, that he was still a Christian. And he felt as deeply as Peter that the indignities heaped uh, upon the Christians uh, and the persecutions by the Turks upon the followers of Jesus. The good prelate entered fully into his views and at his suggestion wrote letters to the Pope 
and to the most influential monarchs of Christianism, Christendom, detailing the sorrows of the faithful and urging them to take up arms in their defense. So um, Peter gains the uh, backing of the Greek church uh, who uh, writes him a, a letter of introduction more or less uh, to the Pope, Pope Urban, whom as we'll see, uh, he also gets uh, uh, Peter the Hermit, an absolute penniless, <laughs> Uh, a total commoner uh, gets a, a uh, an audience with Pope Urban II uh, and convinces uh, that the Crusades are uh, an essential uh, idea, and off we go on the first crusade. It sounds like a lot of people are still joining us. Well, welcome one and all. Enthusiasm is contagious, and the Pope appears to have caught it instantly from one whose zeal was so unbounded. <laughs> Giving the hermit full powers, he sent him, we're talking about Pope Urban II, he sent him abroad to preach the holy war to all the nations and potentates of Christendom. The hermit preached, and countless thousands answered his call. France, Germany, and Italy started at his voice and prepared for the deliverance of Zion. <clears throat> One of the early historians of the crusade, who was himself an eyewitness of the rapture of Europe, describes the personal appearance of the hermit at that time. He says that there appeared to be something of the divine in everything which he said or did. The people so highly reverenced him that they plucked hairs from the mane of his mule. <laughs> that they might keep them as relics. I'm sorry, Joe, before you get too far along, uh, Jim Young had something he wanted to ask you about. Go, go. I, I'm still a little unclear exactly what territory was the target of this crusade, this invasion. I, it, it, was it an invasion or an insurrection? Or uh, who, who was exactly, what countries in, in terms of modern names like Turkey, Syria, whatever. Mm. What countries were the target and what was the objective? To slaughter the populations or to just subject them or to subject them and rob them or what, what exactly what was their go going to be their intended outcome? To rob them, kill them or convert them in that order would be my personal uh, uh, list. And if you happen to know where Jerusalem is, then you know where the Holy Land is, and that's where they were, which is an area a couple hundred miles uh, in circumference, not very big, if you look at it on a map. And uh, so... Uh, so this crusade was uh, confined to uh, an area of maybe a diameter of a couple hundred miles or 200 square miles or what? It, um, the initial crusades, yes, uh, although, most of the crusaders uh, never made it uh, to the Holy Land. Um, they either uh, uh, gave up uh, or uh, uh, were repelled by uh, uh, other uh, countries who had experience from their, uh, the other crusaders who had come through before them uh, who were raping, raping and plundering their way to the Holy Land. And so by the time, in the first case of the first crusade, by the time they got to Bulgaria, the Bulgarians uh, were uh, waiting for them and, and didn't seem to want to be raped and plundered. And in fact, they kicked the shit out of them. <laughs> so so uh, many of the crusaders uh, by the tens of thousands never made it out of Europe. They were very, very poorly organized. So they didn't wait until they got to the Holy Land to do their killing and plundering. They- No, they, 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 had, they, they, they were absolved from any sins um, were forgiven uh, the minute the, the, uh, set for, set foot towards the Holy Land. So all along the way, if they, if you had to travel a thousand miles, you were killing, robbing, well, plundering and raping and Given along the, the way. Yeah, any, anybody that, uh, you know, uh, didn't want to kick in a few bucks or uh, be real friendly, uh, then they just ran over them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Hello. Joe? Jerry, yes. Jerry has a question. Uh, my, my recollection is that this was sort of a reaction 
of the Catholic Church, which ruled the Western uh, European uh, territories, all of them, um, this was a reaction against Islam taking over so much of that part of the world. And this was their effort to try to eliminate Islam before it got too powerful. And they did it over and over again, trying to eradicate Islam from the Holy Land area. Well, as McKay says, there's a, a panoply of reasons, uh, everything from uh, religious churches, uh, vigor to um, business opportunities. Right, but the church's motivation was hmm. to eradicate Islam from that area. Partly, I not think. Correct? Yeah, well, uh, yes, I think that was their um, um, purpose. But again, it, it brings power and wealth automatically when they do that because they assume uh, the taxes, <laughs> the ability to, to levy taxes right. and govern. Uh, so it, we, but it, and, was, it was bad for public relations to have yeah. the Holy Land controlled by Islam. Yes, I think, yeah, that's, that's a good way by in modern uh, point of view. That's a good way to put it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, thank you, Bill. Gary had a question, too. Is it is it um, somewhat fair to really say that in, in some viewpoint, this was really kind of a first world war? And, and secondly, um, is it true or is it fair to, to understand that the marshalling of efforts to begin the Crusades was a, a continuous activity, but there, there was no effective marshalling for one attack. It was getting everybody on the trail as best they could whenever they could join in. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Gary. Um, we restate that. No, I, I was I was asking for clarification. That, is it fair to, to, to view this, the activity, the marshalling of the forces, all the Christian activity um, was, was getting people to join in whenever they could as, as they went along. There, there was not any kind of a concerted effort to say on X date, we're going to get people from region A, B, and C to marshal up and, and go. It was, it was kind of inciting the troops and, and getting all the Christians to say, get on the road, get on the road, get on the road, and keep a constant trail running. Um, and and, is, and that, that causes me to believe that the limited success was attributable to the fact that there was so much activity along the route um, mm -hmm. and, and that there was no concerted activity, concerted effort to really have an objective. You know, everybody's going to be at point A to get into point B and save Jerusalem on, on X date. Well, again, it, it was again, in a way this was, this was essentially a first world war. Well, it was it was more of a, a spontaneous um, uh, reaction, but um, the um, as the Crusades proceeded, um, the Crusaders uh, they did pick up uh, allies uh, as they went, and other people were inspired for the same reasons. Uh, many of them by the same religious fervor. Um, but that's why uh, other countries um, suffered conflict because they were reluctant or unwilling uh, to join or contribute. And so they might as well be, uh, <clears throat> well, used long, uh, as crusade needed, wrung out, shall we say. <laughs> I'm sorry, Joe. How long did the first crusade actually run? And then you said, you, we, you know, we'd be lucky to get into a second or third. What happened at the conclusion of the first crusade? Was, was there any success? In the Christian viewpoint, or did the Muslims beat the shit out of them? Um, well, we'll get to that, and I don't want to be, uh, but a spoiler alert, and that is that uh, there were 12 crusades. If the first one had been a success, there wouldn't have been much need for the other 11. <laughs> uh, the point is, they went back to Europe with their tail between their legs, they got their ass kicked. Uh, and, and a lot of them, uh, again, we won't get into details, uh, probably during this session, but a lot of it had to do with, they'd have some military success because of their overwhelming numbers. Uh, and then they got so involved in squabbling amongst themselves uh, and um, splitting up the spoils and uh, raping the women and drinking themselves into a frenzy uh, that uh, they either squandered any military advantage that they had or reinforcements or other uh, the Turks or other uh, various uh, Saracens that uh, would come along. Uh, and uh, since they were 
uh, exhausted uh, and hung over <laughs> and spent in all kinds of ways, uh, whatever gains they had made militarily uh, would generally be reversed. Oftentimes, um, again, by some of the fiefdoms fighting amongst themselves. Once they beat the Turks, they had nobody to fight with except each other over who got what. <clears throat> it wasn't very inspiring. Well, I have a question. How did the Jewish population fit into all this? Because you've been talking about Muslims and Christians. Mm -hmm. Um, the uh, Jews, of course, are Christ killers, and uh, they were, uh, under many conditions, uh, uh, very uh, subject to um, being slaughtered. Oftentimes, again, um, I think there's some passages in here. Uh, I don't know if we'll get to it today, but the, uh, uh, when they encountered the Crusaders, uh, oftentimes uh, would wipe out the Jews on the way to the Holy Land. They did say something about the Jews financing uh, uh, some of it as well, because um, since it was against the Bible to, to charge interest for money, all the banking functions were automatically conceded to the Jews because they were going to hell anyway. So uh, the Jews were the, were the bankers at that time. The only bankers, and pretty much so, were Jews. So it does mention how uh, they were um, instrumental in financing uh, the war for a profit, of course. Was that because Christians weren't allowed to collect interest? Because Christians because what? You're not allowed to collect interest? That's right. Mm -hmm. I'm looking here to see if I can uh, find a little more about the answer to the question. Uh, may I say something? Yes, go ahead. Um, yeah, on the on the question of uh, collect of uh, interest, um, the the ban against it was one of the elements of society that kept both Christians and Muslims from uh, progressing, shall we say, uh, economically. Right. Interest was one of those things that generated uh, a lot business. Of, <laughs> business, exactly. Yeah. Activity. Yeah, when you can make a million dollars, uh, who cares what the interest rate is, right? It says here that uh, <clears throat> um, Pope Urban, who was a uh, gifted uh, orator, uh, went on to portray the spiritual and the temporal advantages that would accrue to those who took up arms in the service of the cross. Palestine, he said, was a land flowing with milk and honey and precious in the sight of God as the scene of the grand events which had saved mankind. That land, he promised, should be divided among them. And that's the answer to your question, uh, Jim Young, Palestine and Jerusalem. Right? Um, moreover, let's see, uh, land should be divided among them. Okay, well, that's an incentive to crusade. Moreover, they should have full pardon for all their offenses, either against God or man. Go then, he added, in expiation of your sins, and go assured that after this world shall have passed away, imperishable glory shall be yours in the world which is to come. So, there you have it. You get paid in, uh, you know, if you're one of the um, lords, one of the leaders, you can uh, divide up the spoils, and if you're not, uh, well, you just have to settle for whatever rape and plunder you know, sort of a trickle, trickle down plunder. <laughs> uh, James A. Young. Uh, it's an excellent demonstration that religious nuts are willing to commit any crime against humanity when they believe that they ha are acting at their God's behest. <clears throat> Particularly if the uh, benefits uh, um, include uh, land and uh, all the plunder you can steal. Yeah. We don't have to go back uh, too far to look at uh, Joshua. If you uh, uh, read uh, when he and Moses went up to the top of Mount Nebo, 
you know, there were seven cities. If you round up the number of people, he killed 25 million people, according to the numbers in the Bible, uh, with God's help. <laughs> What's a few well, what, what was uh, God doing to facilitate this? Because as I understand it, uh, the Israelites had to do all of the killing. It, that's right. They did all the heavy lifting. Yeah. So God just cheered them on. That's right. Well, he gave them the power. You know, it's a lot of hard work uh, smiting people with a big heavy sword all day. So uh, he gave them the power and the inspiration uh, to uh, kill people um, in droves uh, so that he didn't have to do it himself. But I think that as you go through this a little further, you'll see that the price of uh, committing crimes against humanity at God's behest, the price is pretty steep. <laughs> yes, every, you just have to do everything he says. Oh, I guess they had an aurora borealis of unusual brilliancy appeared, and thousands of the crusaders came out to gaze upon it, prostrating themselves upon the earth in adoration. It was thought to be a sure prognostic of the interposition of the Most High and a representation of his armies fighting with and overthrowing the infidels. Reports of wonders were everywhere. Flaming swords, myriads of stars, on and on. <clears throat> Uh, Joe, uh, Rick O'Keefe had a comment in the um, chat uh, that uh, I don't know if he wants to say it or he wants me to. Uh, but Rick, go ahead. Yeah. Rick? Well, go ahead and read it, I guess, Judy, if okay. you want to. What he says is there was no more unity among Muslims than among Christians. The cities of the Middle East were mostly independent, frequently trying to dominate others and control trade routes. It was difficult for Muslims to create a united front against crusaders. Well, um, again, when you're, um, you know, um, life is under immediate threat by hordes of people, uh, unity is a lot easier to achieve. Uh, but I would agree that their, their tendency uh, uh, to agree to have unity was less. Although everything I know about the uh, Muslim religion is that it's uh, pretty strict. So I don't know how they behaved at that time. So I'm not in a position to really comment uh, in an uninformed manner on who was the better organized. <laughs> I did want to read this one uh, line you had asked about the Jews and how they were affected. The nobles mortgaged their estates for mere trifles to Jews and unbelievers or conferred charters of immunity upon the towns and communes within their fiefs for sums which a few years previously they would have rejected with disdain. disdain. <laughs> but I like it. So they, uh, sell, the, sell the farm uh, to, the, to the Jews so they can go rescue the Holy Land. Interesting, he also said unbelievers. And unbelievers, right. Yeah. Well, an unbeliever wouldn't have any fear of hell, so right. they wouldn't mind. Yeah. You know, we often think there were no atheists back then, but there were quite a number yeah. of atheists. Yeah, right. We've just been Although he, a lot. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Jim wants to know if unbelievers loan money to the nobles. Jim Peterson wants to know that. If unbelievers lend money to whom? Loaned money to the nobles. Oh, I see. Well, according to this passage, yes, the nobles um, mortgaged their uh, fiefdoms uh, for pennies on the dollars to Jews and unbelievers. Yes. So. That's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Well, again, it's um, it's interesting how uh, religion affects um, everything from the 
size of your beard to the way you dress to the number of buttons on your hassock to the amount of hair you do or don't have to how much money you can lend or not lend just want to just mind their own business uh, they'd be far less uh, of a pain in the ass that's for sure um, Dan made a statement about he thought Jews were not allowed to own property back then. We'll have what? That Jews were not allowed to own property back then. Oh, oh, I see. Uh, right. <clears throat> I think there were, I, I suppose it was possible, but there were some severe restrictions on it. I know they, they were, could own property within the Jewish ghetto, perhaps. Does anybody know? I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm wondering about the Islamic faith, if they controlled Jerusalem and Palestine, uh, their attitude is that people of other religions are uh, second class citizens and they may have had rules against them owning anything. If that, might be, that might be accurate, I don't know. Yeah, whether they were Jewish or not. I, I I don't know. I don't know. I don't recall it being mentioned anywhere uh, uh, in this text. Um, but uh, I do know that, uh, as I say, the tourists were welcome there as long as they had money. Now we live in a tourist area, uh, so we know firsthand um, the attitude towards tourists that don't have money, which is why don't you go to New York, or Georgia, or any place <laughs> that, or any place here. <laughs> That's how we got here. Yeah, right. <laughs> <All> right. <laughs> Without your thumb and off we go. Well, um, let me get back to uh, Mr. McKay here for a paragraph or two. Um, and uh, he does go in in this part uh, to the various people who participated. It is now time to speak of the leaders of the expedition. Great multitudes ranged themselves under the command of Peter the Hermit, whom as the originator, they considered the most appropriate leader of the war. Others joined the banner of a bold adventurer whom history has dignified with no other name than that of Gautier sans avoir or Walter the Penniless. But who is represented as having been a noble family and well skilled in the art of war? A third multitude from Germany flocked around the standard of a monk named Gottschalk of whom nothing is known except that he was a fanatic of the deepest dye. All these bands, which together are said to amount to 300,000 men, women, and children, were composed of the vilest rascality of Europe. Without discipline, principle, or true courage, they rushed through the nations like a pestilence, <laughs> spreading terror and death wherever they went. The first multitude that set forth was led by Walter the Penniless, early in the spring of 1096, but then a very few months after the Council of Claremont. Each man of that irregular host aspired to be his own master. Like their nominal leader, each was poor to penury and trusted for subsistence on his journey to the chances of the road. Rolling through Germany like a tide, they entered Hungary, where at first they were received with some degree of kindness by the people. The latter had not yet caught sufficient of the fire of enthusiasm to join the crusade themselves, but were willing enough to forward the cause by aiding those embarked in it. Unfortunately, this good understanding did not last long. The swarm were not contented with food for their necessities, but craved for luxuries also. They attacked and plundered the dwellings of the country people and thought nothing of murder where resistance was offered. On their arrival before Simlin, the outraged Hungarians collecting in large numbers and attacking the rear of the crusading host, slew a great many of the stranglers and taking away their arms and crosses, affixed them as trophies to the walls of the cities. Walter appears to have been in no mood or condition to make reprisals for his reprisals for his army, destructive as a plague of locust when plunder urged them on, were useless against any regular attack from a determined enemy. 
the progress of the army was more like a retreat than an advance. <laughs> And if it were possible to find a rabble more vile than the army of Walter the Penniless, it was that led by Peter the Hermit. Apparently they arrived in Semlin after Walter the Penniless. As I said a minute ago, got there first. And they were incensed uh, when they found the arms and the crosses of their predecessors hanging uh, as trophies above the gates. And so they attacked, this is Peter the Hermit, they, uh, they attacked the city tumultuously. Um, and they entered not by dint of bravery, but of superior numbers. And the city was given up to all of the horrors which follow when victory, brutality, and licentiousness are linked together. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Peter the Hermit had blown the popular fury into a flame, but to cool it again was beyond his power. Much like the Trump era. Uh, whatever. Didn't the plague happen after the Crusades? Maybe they brought it back. <laughs> okay. Well. So they didn't wait till they got to the Holy Land. They just started slaughtering in Germany and Hungary. Correct. Well, again, as I said, it's, it's like Groundhog Day. There is no consequences. It's not uh, that. They're, they're traveling. It's an army that's not traveling on with, with supplies. They're going and plundering as they go along. Supposedly, that was the same problem with the, uh, if the exodus of, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands uh, left from, um, you know, from Egypt. There was no record of them plundering as they went along. But... Well, then again, no. Well, here's the end of um, the um, uh, Peter the Hermit. What was the grand result of all these struggles? And again, he goes on for 65 pages talking about, and I haven't even mentioned, there's about a half a dozen different uh, knights and, and lords and various aristocrats who have brought their own um, entourage or their own little armies with them, uh, some of whom spend their time again fighting with each other uh, over the spoils. But that's what he means when he says uh, the grand result of all of these struggles. Europe expended millions of her treasures and the blood of two millions of her children and a handful of quarrelsome knights retained possession of Palestine for about a hundred years. Even had Christendom retained it to this day, the advantage, if confined, if confined to that, would have been too dearly purchased. But notwithstanding the fanaticism that originated and the folly that conducted them, the Crusades were not productive of unmitigated evil, the feudal chiefs became better members of, in, of society by coming in contact in Asia with a civilization superior to their own. The people secured some small installments of their rights. Kings, no longer at war with their nobility, had time to pass some good laws. The human mind learned some little wisdom from hard experience and casting off the sloth of superstition in which the Roman clergy had so long enveloped it, became prepared to receive the seeds of the approaching Reformation. Thus did the all-wise disposer of nations of the West 
by means of the very fanaticism that had led them against the East, become a subject of absorbing interest, and if carried fully out in all its bearings, would consume more space than the plan of this work will allow. So that's what they got. Nothing other than um, some culture and the Reformation, for which uh, we can thank them dearly. Rick O'Keefe had quite a comment in the um, chat. I, Rick, can you share your your words in the meeting, please? I shall verbalize. Thank you. So list it again. Well, seen as the prelude to the First Crusade, uh, our friend uh, Peter the Dirty and Unwashed was comprised of incompetent peasants who were fleeing a uh, terrible drought throughout Europe, which resulted in famine and disease in their homelands. The uh, Crusaders would be responsible for brutally slaying as many as one million people, it is estimated, as they progressed throughout Europe. They were killing Jews and anybody who they thought was worth looting on their way to the Middle East. So they were murdering a lot of Christians on the way. Uh, one fourth to one third of the Jewish population along the Rhine River in France and Germany were slaughtered. And the people who were doing this were not just peasants, but also landless nobles. Uh, they were looking for a way to create a future in the Middle East for themselves and owning property and so forth that they could not obtain in Europe. But the popes themselves, uh, over the course of the Crusades, saw the Crusades as a means of keeping control over the nobility and <clears throat> the tiny and fairly weak nations. Well, they weren't even nations at that point, the principalities and so forth in Europe. Europe was not a powerful force. <clears throat> they were totally disorganized and each little organization was fairly weak. So, there's no monolithic Europe attacking a monolithic Muslim state. That's all I have to say at this point. Yeah, I, I think one thing this article does is point out how many uh, different uh, peoples and countries were involved. Um, some of them um, very much so, some of them just uh, by contributing money, uh, but all of them had a motive. And in most cases, uh, it was more uh, power uh, and uh, money than it was uh, religious fervor or rescuing uh, the Holy Land and the birthplace of Jesus uh, from the uh, unbelievers. I, I just want to touch briefly on one other crusade and, and then uh, my presentation will be done. We can converse, but and that's the Children's Crusade, uh, which was early in the spring of 1213. A body of crusaders was raised in France and Germany uh, by two different 12 year old uh, boys, as a matter of fact. <laughs> An immense number of boys and girls, amounting, according to some accounts, to 30,000, were incited by the persuasion of two monks to undertake the journey to Palestine. They were no doubt composed of the idle and deserted children who generally swarm in great cities, nurtured in vice and daring, and ready for anything. The object of the monks <clears throat> seems to have been the atrocious one of inveigling them into slave ships on the pretense of sending them to Syria and selling them for slaves on the coast of Africa. Although what they preached was that being children, they would go there and not even take arms against the um, Muslims, they would convert them uh, to Christianity because their arguments would be so powerful and their inspiration so great because of their age. Uh, that it uh, wouldn't be long until everybody in Jerusalem would be Christian and we wouldn't have to overthrow anybody. Nevertheless, uh, they were brought up as slaves and sent off to the interior of the country. <laughs> most, so most of them uh, were sold into slavery and prostitution almost immediately. Another detachment arrived in Genoa, but the accomplishment, accomplices in this horrid plot 
having taken no measures at that port, expecting them all to go to Mar Marseille, they were induced by the residents of uh, Genoa to return to their homes. Uh, so some of them uh, did uh, get back, although again, they were just street urchins living in poverty for the, main, for the most part. But it's still, it's a good idea of, um, when it comes to religion, no crackpot idea is too crackpot. And the more uh, from outer space, uh, the better. It was Origen who argued that Christianity was believable. The story of, of uh, Jehovah and Jesus was believable because it was so unbelievable that nobody would be stupid enough to invent something like this because nobody would believe it. Therefore, it must be true. Based on that, I have some arguments I'd like to present. <laughs> they all involve tithing. Anyway, those are my prepared uh, comments, of which mostly, again, involve reading a comedy from the text. Uh, but it, it, some interesting conclusions that the real benefits from the Crusades uh, were collateral benefits. Uh, again, a more civilizing effect and the uh, introduction uh, of the Renaissance. Jim? Uh, that statement you made about uh, Peterson. <laughs> oh, Good. one second, uh, uh, Jim. Uh, Jim Peterson had his hand up. Uh, you go next, okay? Okay, Jim Peterson. You're muted. Jim, you're muted. You're, you're muted, Jim. Can you hear me? Sorry about that. Okay, there he goes. All right, yes. I was wondering if you could elaborate, elaborate a little bit more about the effect of the connection between the Crusades and the development of the Renaissance. And uh, secondarily, if you could elaborate a little bit or have a few comments about the effect of the Crusades on the modern situation that we face with uh, radical Islam and uh, re results such as 9-11 and the uh, continuing bad relationship between uh, the ostensibly Christian West mm -hmm. and the very uh, 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 concentrated uh, Islamic world. Well, I, I can't... Um make a comment uh, uh, on the latter as to how it has uh, affected uh, the uh, Muslim point of view towards the West, although it can't have been beneficial. Uh, the Crusades went on for the better part of 400 years. As I said earlier, there were 12 of them. At one point, the, um, the Muslims were actually willing to uh, concede Jerusalem uh, to get them to stop coming over and slaughtering them <laughs> on a regular basis. But that wasn't enough. They wanted all of Palestine. And so that deal fell through as well. But, but uh, clearly it, it had to have a unifying effect on the Muslims, as I said before, when you're uh, uh, about to be murdered by a, a horde of fanatics, uh, you start looking for friends uh, and you end up uh, with a lot of debts of gratitude uh, and feelings of, of brotherhood, you know, brothers in arms, uh, as it were. So uh, uh, as for the uh, Europeans, uh, it's obvious that after 400 years and 12 crusades uh, and spending who knows how many millions of lives, uh, they did not uh, own, <laughs> control, or run the Holy Land. Now, uh, if Joshua can make walls fall down and time stand still and kill 50,000 people on a single afternoon. Why can't we? And why is God so, so good to Joshua and so indifferent to our problems and crusades? Uh, and so it caused people to begin to ask questions. It, um, it became a wedge issue. <laughs> it's that little niche that opens the door uh, where no matter what the church has been telling you about the powers and the wonders of the almighty, reality begins to rear its ugly head. Uh, just like an, another of the great causes of, uh, that they cite as one of the uh, uh, catalysts uh, to the uh, 
um, Renaissance was the great tidal wave that uh, wiped out the city of Cadiz, I believe it was, uh, Spain on a Sunday morning when everyone was in church. And again, it raised the question, well, why did it kill? Why did God kill all these people? They're all holy, very religious people. Jim Young, or uh, excuse me, Jim uh, Peterson. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up a little bit. I was thinking in terms of the, 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 the connection between an edict of an Islamic um, uh, cleric uh, declaring that uh, the literature of the ancient world was no longer to be studied uh, by uh, the imams and, uh, uh, is, and, and Islam generally, and uh, the fact that so much of that very literature had been delivered into the hands of the West or carried into the countries of the West by the Crusaders about uh, the books of uh, Plato and, 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 and Aristotle and so on and so forth. Yes, if it hadn't been for them, they would have all gone up in smoke when they burnt the Lyceum. That's right. Yeah. So, so they, in, in large part, saved Western uh, history and philosophy yeah. uh, and the works of the really heavy thinkers. Uh, we wouldn't have those today if it weren't for the Arabs. We do. We owe them a great debt for a lot of reasons, we do. one of which is that uh, we didn't we didn't win. <laughs> we, we owe them for that. <laughs> Good for them. Well, just there's not it isn't as if there isn't enough conflict there yet. Well, uh, the other thing was that uh, you frequently hear in the propaganda uh, reportage uh, or the reportage about propaganda from the uh, Islamic extremists that uh, Westerners are considered to be crusaders. I mean, uh, a lot of newspapers and uh, things in the uh, Islamic, in the Arab world call Westerners crusaders. Right. Well, I, I remember after 9-11, I think it was Bush used the word crusade. And, and everybody, no, don't say that. <laughs> Not that one. <laughs> bad, bad. It's like swearing in front of your mother. Jim Young. Uh, the uh, comment you made about uh, the more unbelievable it is, it seems that uh, the eat more readily people flock to. I lost it. I lost your audio, Jim. Can't hear you, Jim. Doesn't know. He's Can't saying hear you. he's giving up. All right. Oh, he's muted now, but he wasn't before. Okay. All right. Whatever you say. Well, I thought one of the interesting things was that the um, the children's crusade included girls, and I wonder how Christians. Um, of course, I realize that you're either a whore or a Madonna in Christian ideology, um, but I just wondered how they justified sending, well, children into war to begin with, but, and into slavery, but how they justified sending young girls into war. Well, I think they used the same reasoning, uh, which was that they, they weren't going to fight, they were going to preach, and that you know, uh, God can do anything. And um, uh, look at how Paul, uh, how many people um, Paul uh, converted um, uh, to Christianity. And if Paul could do that sort of thing, certainly the children could do it too. So I don't think it had anything to do with so much with their gender as it had to do with were they poor and parentless? No one to care about them, whether they lived or died. Yeah, well, plus they had nothing to lose anyway, or a little to lose. So uh, they may be better off as a prostitute in Jerusalem and Palestine than they were as a match girl in London. <laughs> so was it the Muslims who bought the children? Or who bought the children who as slaves? Well, it doesn't say. Ah. It just says that they were immediately sold into slavery uh, and or prostitution. So my guess is they never got out of town. I 
unless they were taken away after they were sold. But uh, no, I, I, I don't see anything that even suggests that they, was, they were bought by the Muslims. They either were sold immediately or the other group went to Genoa uh, and uh, were persuaded just to go back home. So none of them ever made it out of, uh, out of Europe, let alone out of town. Other questions, anyone? Comments? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I just wanted to comment that uh, this preaching that was supposedly going to take place, I wondered whether or not it, you preached, uh, they preached to their victims before they slaughtered them or the, afterward. And also this comment you made about how uh, the absurdity of the uh, narrative that they were preaching um, was readily embraced. And it reminded me of current events in the United States where um, people are saying, uh, <coughs> lawyers who are being sued now and other people for billions of dollars are saying, well, it was so stupid what I was saying, uh, nobody in their right mind would have believed me, but yet they had millions believing them. Did that all get through or did I go yes. through? Yeah, I'm, I'm just weighing it. Uh, I don't know why it is that uh, people are often convinced by uh, things that are more incredible, but you don't have to look much farther than QAnon to see that that phenomenon is still at play. <laughs> you don't have to go down and check out the Baptists. Um, <laughs> it's, it's on display at, at a secular level as well. Well, I might jump in here and then uh, let you know that on 5-9, we will have a man of oh, crap. I went just there. Sorry. Uh, Andrew Norman, who will talk to us about what to do about mass irrationality and uh, applications of the emerging science of mental immunity. So it might tie in nicely to this whole thought process of people buying outrageous ideas and, and um being duped, but it must also be said that at that time, at least, they had little access to knowledge and they could only believe what the priest and the clergy told them. They didn't know anything else. The only reason we have stained glass is to teach the story of the Bible to illiterate people. Um, so it's, it's not surprising that they believed in a lot of magical thinking back then. Mm -hmm. To me, it's not surprising. Oh, I'm sure they, they couldn't tell the difference between uh, magic and, and reality. Right. Um, one of the things that the French did <clears throat> uh, later on uh, after, after the, the Renaissance was taking place was to try to curb the superstition uh, among the peasants. And they sent magicians uh, out to the countryside to show them magic tricks and how to do them. And one of the tricks that they particularly uh, uh, featured was how to turn a stick into a snake. You might recall uh, uh, Moses and the Pharaoh when he turned his staff and stave into a snake and then the Pharaoh's uh, wise men did the same thing and then his snake ate the other snakes and the Pharaoh's uh, snakes. But, so being able to turn your staff, uh, your stick into a snake uh, was something that we knew was certainly people did it even if they didn't do it very often because the Bible tells us so. So anyway, one of the things they did was, <laughs> was to, another thing they had a, a frenzy going on in the town, something to do with the women that were just going insane. He had them thrown into the lake, which cured them. <laughs> so the, the, there have been attempts on the secular level to deal with these kinds of things. Um, but uh, after the 15th century, I'm pretty sure. Again, and it was the Crusades that opened the door. It's kind of ironic that something as wholly irrational in so many aspects as the Crusades would be the implement that was used to elevate uh, uh, European civilization to a higher level of rationality. 
reasoning. Yeah, right. Yeah. Irrationality begets ration begets reasoning. Yes, crazy. But at least Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> any hope for humanity <laughs> on a rational level? Sure. I mean, we still have the Cro Magnum mind. Yes, and, and nuclear technology. <laughs> yeah. We'll use this on the guy in the cave next door. <laughs> it's like not putting a nuclear bomb in a child's hand for a toy. It is, yeah. 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 Um, it's a very uh, dangerous uh, mix. I don't know what we can do about it. Um, again, my, my position on that is that we should not make any more weapons of mass destruction until we use up the ones we already have. <laughs> uh, Mark Brandt had, well, Eileen had a comment in the um, chat about the, I, I can't, I don't, can't, uh, no, it, was, it was, yeah. a, it was a, it was a program I had seen on, uh, I think it's on Netflix, CAD file, and it's a really good actor that was in um, Howard's End, or, no, who and he played, um, oh, yeah, my brain goes, Anyway, um, he's a good actor, British actor, but it sort of shows like the, the whole sort of peasantry during that era. I mean, yeah, there were, you know, diseases and all this other, and this monk had returned from, you know, the, the, the character had returned from the Crusades and he's now a pacifist. I just thought it was interesting to sort of get a feeling of what life was like at that era. I mean, people had nothing, you know, they were, and if they were the, the youngest uh, of the, the son of the family, they ended up having no inheritance at all. So they would go off to a crusade, any any place to make their wealth. So that, right. that was part of it. The um, British were pr primarily guilty of that. They practiced primogeniture. And so the oldest yeah. son got everything. And of course, the oldest son might not be too friendly with his younger brothers. Uh, that's been known to happen. So. Whereas uh, they sent the criminal, the real criminals, uh, they sent them to uh, Australia, you know, or Devil's Island or whatever. So that the criminals that we have that were sent to the U.S. Uh, were primarily uh, aristocracy, uh, debtors, uh, and which is why Georgia, which is where most of them went, basically has a slavery and an aristocracy type system um, with plantations and slaves and serfs. It was really set up along the lines of what they knew back home. Mr. Young. Uh, well, wait, Mark Brandt made oh, a comment uh, in the, um, in the um, uh, chat. Thank you, Mark, Judy. did you yeah. want to say something about this? Nope, guess he doesn't. Um, his comment is that he thought Goebbels may have said something like, the bigger the lie, more people who believe it. Mm -hmm. And then he made a, a political comment um, that it's his reflect his political uh, opinion and not, not necessarily mine. Look at the number of folks who believe Trump's big lie. There you have it. Um, Something like that. Fifty to seventy percent of Republicans think the election was stolen. Um, Jim Young now. Sorry. Okay, so is there any indication as to what percentage of the Crusaders actually arrived uh, at the border of the Holy Land to in attack? And is if there was a substantial depletion of their forces along the way, uh, is what impact uh, does that? have on the final outcome when it came time to actually uh, attack the Holy Land? Well, of course, the early uh, efforts uh, up to the third that we went through today were, were pretty much uh, total failures. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they did get wiser and better as they went along. They knew what cities to avoid uh, so that they wouldn't have to fight their way through. Uh, and uh, uh, they could take a short land route and then go by sea which saved them a lot of trouble as well. So um, a higher percentage actually made it uh, to the Holy Land. And they did have some successes, as I said. They had, they had by far superior numbers. And we're talking about two, 300,000 people at a time. <laughs> That's a lot of people. 
not against the whole country, but they're not fighting the whole country. They're fighting a city at a time. And it overwhelmed the smaller cities, but that didn't do them any good because they couldn't keep anything that, uh, that they won because they then squandered it by fighting amongst themselves. So, but they did get better at it, I'm sure. And a lot more of them did reach that. I would suggest that you read the text. You can download it as a PDF. And uh, there are uh, a lot of other uh, incredibly stupid things that human beings have done. The magnetism craze is very interesting for one. Uh, the, uh, Jim what, uh, the, tech, the link to the text was in the emails that were sent this morning and also in the uh, meetup. So everybody should have access to the text. If not, you can email me and I'll send you the link. Royalty free. Royalty free. <laughs> Tim Peterson? Oh, thank you. Well, I was just going to say that from my perspective, at least, I think one uh, conclusion we can draw from this uh, discussion, or that I can draw at least, is that the most prominent problem facing the development of the human species, and remember, all this is within the past thousand years, which seems like a lot of time, but it's not very much in, uh -huh. the, in, the, in the history of the natural world. It's nothing at all. And uh, it seems to me that we have um, created a condition and situations that um, strongly militate against our continuing existence as long as we uh, have a, a social, economic, and political system that makes it possible for people to believe nonsense. If we're ever going to succeed as a species, we have to overcome this propensity and um, and, 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 and to do so in, in large crowds, uh, just a few people at the top, a few uh, elites, like ourselves, of course, um, who, who have a knowledge of how to discriminate uh, nonsense from useful information is insufficient to overcome the problem. So we're, we're going to have to figure out ways in which we can get masses of people to get very smart very quickly. Uh, good luck with that. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll need a lot of luck. Keep in mind that um, animals um, or anything does not evolve because of need or want. Okay, if we could change because we need to, we'd still have dinosaurs. We meaning life forms, the royal we. Mm -hmm. yeah. So evolution happens by chance. But but for our sake, we can't afford to take that chance. We can't, we can't <laughs> right. afford to wait for evolution right. to work. Mm -hmm. Right, so and we should start now to wipe out all of the inferior races. <laughs> um, so my, I think Wait, Jim, Michael has a comment. Michael, would you like to share that into the uh, chat? Um, I was just making a comment that the uh, crusader mentality is basically the same mentality that the colonists had that came over from Europe in the age of exploration. Like, for instance, with the uh, colonizing of the Americas, you know, the pilgrims weren't coming here escaping religious persecution. They were coming here trying to spread religious their religion you know the pilgrims very much came over here if you read the early um writings from the colonists they came over here specifically because they wanted to found what they call the kingdom of god and you know they viewed the native americans the same way that they viewed people like the muslims as you know heathens that needed to be conquered <clears throat> that was all Thank you. Michael. I would like, I would like to make one small point about the pilgrims, and that is, they did not flee uh, either England uh, or Holland uh, to flee religious persecution. They left Holland because the the Dutch would not let them persecute other people for not being pilgrims. So they left so they could persecute, not so that they could escape it. Thanks, Joe. And Rick O'Keefe put a uh, link to a good resource about the First Crusade in the